Well, I don't know how many of you noticed, but my title for my sermon today is What is Worship and How to Do It? And it's, it's a look at the idea of why we're here. It's a look at the idea of how do we communicate with God and how do we show God that we love Him. It's also the idea of how do we get together and do things. So to this week and next week, we're going to be looking at what it is and what it was. And then we're going to look at what are we actually doing today. And how do we worship today? What is the neat way that we do that? First of all, worship has many names in the Hebrew language. They used many different ones. I picked a couple, and I'm going to pronounce them. <laughs> You'll have to do this. The first one is Saha. I like that. S-A-H-A-H. And it means to prostrate oneself and bow down. I don't know how many of you ever noticed, but in Old Testament and in old movies, whenever you were in the presence of God or whenever you were talking to God, you got down on the floor. In fact, the flatter you could get, the better. Now, our chairs don't really make it really easy for that. And so, you, you know, we'd have to get out in the halls and the walls and, you know. Um, but that was prostrate, was put yourself right down flat. Get as low as you could in honor of God and in, in reverence of God. And the second one was proscunio, P-R-O-S-K-U-N-E-O. If you want these spellings later, you can give them to you. And it's to make obscience, to, deliver, to do reverence to an act of homage or reverence. It's the idea that God is an awesome God. And we're supposed to, we're supposed to be in awe of him. Sometimes it's really easy to talk about God just kind of like, oh yeah, that's God. But it's our almighty God. It's the hallelujah God. And we should be in reverence. We should be in awe of him. And so I think sometimes we just kind of lose that. And, and I'm going to relate it to a concept today. Respect is something that is lacking in our communities, in our society today. And I think it's starting to filter into the church. We've lost the respect for God. Now I'm not saying you personally have. I'm saying I'm seeing it around. We don't have that reverence. We don't have that, that, that sense of mystique and the sense of, sense of um, power when we're in the presence of God. And guess what? When you're gathered together, you're in the presence of God. So I think we need to look at that. Ralph Martins in his book, The Worship of God, states, The worship of God is an act of community and is to be done under the authority of the Word of God. Makes sense, eh? Get together as a community, and worship God using his word, looking at his word, living by his word. And we need to do that. And it's important that you understand what that means. The Encyclopedia of the Bible defines it as true worship is a genuine response to God, which shows itself in a life lived to please God. Worship centers on God. When we get together and we have a worship service like this, it's not about us. It's not about the worship team. It's not about the preacher. It's about God. That's why we're here. All the rest of that is just the blessings God gives us when we get together and do that. And so I want you to be encouraged. Live a life to please God. That's worship. Did you realize that? Your day-to-day -day walk is worshiping God if you're living a life to please God. If you get into a, into a life that is, oh, it's all about me. What am I going to do? What can I accomplish? And where am I going? You're not worshiping with God. Because you're worshiping yourself. And that is not a good place to be. It's about worshiping God. Living a life to please God. Now we go back to the times before Jesus came to earth. What was worship to the people before Jesus came? Well, let's have a look. Remember, we're looking at the Jewish people. I'm not looking at the entire population of the world at that time because there was lots of different cultures and religions and stuff. But we're looking at the Jewish people because that's our heritage, our, origin, our original heritage. And we want to see how they handled worship. Second Chronicles 29, verses 27 to 30. 
And you have to know this is back, uh, this is one of the books that gives you a lot of the rules and a lot of the, how they did things back then. Hezekiah gave the order to sacrifice the burnt offering on the altar. As the offering began, singing to the Lord began also, accompanied by trumpets and instruments of David, king of Israel. The whole assembly bowed in worship while the singers sang and the trumpeters played. All this continued until the sacrifice of the burnt offering was completed. When the offerings were finished, the king and everyone present with him knelt down and worshipped. King Hezekiah and his officials ordered the Levites to praise the Lord with the words of David and of Asaph the seer. They sang praises with gladness and bowed their heads and worshipped. Reverence. Awe. The magnificence of God. They, they put it where it was belonged. And they really did. And it does, you do notice that every good worship service has music. If it's a worship service. Uh, if you are worshiping God yourself, oh, you can sing, play music. It's awesome. Because it's a way of celebrating the, and the eternal God that we love. The, the whole assembly got together and did this. And each person had a part. Some sang. Some played instruments. Some prayed. Some did the leading. Just like we do today. God gives gifts to everybody. Let's jump to Joshua 22, verses 26 and 27. Joshua was an incredible guy, and he spent a lot of time trying to tell the leaders of the countries and the, and the churches, God has a plan, you got to listen. He also has many stories. You've, you've all read stories about Joshua and the Battle of Jericho. And we talked about that a few, few years back. We did a sermon on building that temple back, the walls back up and knocking them down. Joshua 22. That is why we said, let us get ready and build an altar. But not for burnt offerings or sacrifices. On the contrary, it is to be a witness between us and you and the generations that follow. That's us. That we will worship the Lord at his sanctuary with our burnt offerings, sacrifices, and fellowship offerings. Then in the future, your descendants will not be able to say to ours, you have no share in the Lord. You see, they had these altars. They built these altars. And they sacrificed animals on these altars. And that was their way of connecting to God. And there's a whole bunch of other steps when you get into the temple and, the, and who can go where. But the idea was is that they had to find a way to, uh, to say to God, please, please forgive us. Please be our God. And here we'll sacrifice as you've told us to. Joshua is saying, here's another altar. Only we're not going to kill anything on this altar. This is going to be a reminder for the future forever that this is where we come to God. And so in some senses... And I'm going to be real loose here for a second. In some senses, this table is like that. It's there to remind us. And you read the thing on the front. It's there to remind us of who Jesus was and what he did. It's our communion table. It's the one that we use to share communion together. Joshua had this altar and he said, this is going to be the reminder. The reminder of what we do and why we do it. As you can see, the Jewish religion was into sacrifices and, and, and altars and worshiping God through that method. They were separated from God and had no permanent sacrifice yet. So they were still doing that. That's why Jesus came to earth in the body of a human, in human form, to be able to be the sacrifice, that final sacrifice. In the Christian world, we do not do animal sacrifices anymore. And that's because Jesus came and was that final sacrifice. Once and for all. Done. No need for any more. The Encyclopedia of the Bible gives us this explanation of that. To worship is to give God the honor due to him. In the Psalms, God's people worship him for who he is. For what he's done in creation. For what he has done in redemption. Rescuing and freeing his people. And you've got to realize... God has rescued and freed the Jewish people many times. They are a wayward bunch. Kind of like us. We tend to try to go our own way sometimes. And God has to rescue us from that. 
And if you're sitting here today and, and you're wandering off, God will rescue you. He promises that. You just got to trust him. Okay? And it goes on. For all God's good gifts and blessings to individuals. That's what worship's all about. We're thanking God for all the good things he's done for us. All the blessings he's given us. And if all of you are still breathing, and I think you are, all right, you've been given a blessing. Life. A life to live pleasing God. And that's what he wants you to do. He doesn't want you to, 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 to be in pain. He doesn't want you to have to wander around aimlessly not knowing where you're going. He wants you to have a life with him. Exciting life. I'm going to warn you, if you ever decide you are going to fully commit to God and you're going to really get active for God, he will take you on a journey. And you will be stretched. So be looking for that. Because I found out the other day that until my breath goes out of my body, God expects me to use my body for him. So I don't care how old you are. I don't care how sick you are. I don't care any of that kind of stuff. In the sense of it's not that important when, other than if you know who God is and you're living for God. Then all those things he can look after. And he will. The scripture that I put on the sign outside was Psalm 95, 1 to 7. And I'm going to use this as what I call a transition scripture. We're going from Old Testament to the New Testament. But I want to use Psalm 95. Because I like Psalm 95. It was kind of real similar to the one that Eleanor read. Because it rocks. And I like that. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Do you realize that when you're singing, you're supposed to be doing it better than that? You're supposed to be loud. Sing out. Don't be, don't be scared. Be brave. Let us come before him with thanksgiving. We come with thanks. The Lord is looking after us. He's providing everything for us. And extol him with music and song. See? Music and song. It's there. Part of a worship service. For the Lord is the great God, the great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks belong to him because he built everything. And the sea is his for he made it and his hands formed the dry land. Come let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker. For he is our God and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. The Bible's full of references to shepherds and the flock. God is our shepherd. We are his flock. And we need to learn to trust our God. We need to learn to expect him to be there. And he will be. We need to learn to follow him. Because he knows the way. That is so important. But it's also important to remember that he made everything. There's nothing in this world that he didn't make. Now, I, you, I've had people argue with me that today, well, we got televisions and God didn't make those. Well, no, he probably didn't make the television, but he gave the brain to the person who did and the wisdom and the abilities. So he's still making the world. But the physical world that we live in was made by God and he did it for us. He didn't do it for him. He did it for us. He wanted to have a people that he could relate to, that he could have a relationship with, and he needed somewhere to do it. So he didn't pick the sun, because it's a little too hot for our little frail bodies, and he didn't pick way out in outer space where it's too cold. He picked earth. This wonderful little ball sitting out there in heaven that has all the right things for us to exist. And he created it for us. Do you realize that? He created this for us. I get so excited when I think about that. And that makes me want to worship him. Doesn't that? Doesn't that make you want to just get out there and shout and sing and, and thank him? And that's what worship is all about. So let's go take another look at worship in the 
time of Jesus. John 4, 19 to 26, and we've done this, this little scripture passage before. It's the woman at the well, but I had a different theme that time. So I'm going to read it fast for you. Sir, the woman said, Jesus is talking to her at the well, Samaritan woman. I can see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. You've got to understand the battle going on there. There was all kinds of things. Moses had the Ten Commandments on a mountain. Uh, a lot of the religions thought you had to go up to the top of a mountain to worship God. And the Jews were saying, no, 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 you've got to come down to Jerusalem. That's where our temple is. You've got to come there. Jesus declared, believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on the mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews, God's chosen people. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that the Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Wow, what she didn't know. So Jesus says, I who speak to you am he. Interesting language. Basically what he said he was, I am. Last week I mentioned I am a couple times. Who's I am? Oh, come on. Thank you. You guys have to speak up or you're not going to get heard on the tape. You've got to be loud. Bold. All right. I am God. And that woman was blown away. Only she didn't even totally understand that she was in the presence of God. She just kind of thought, well, okay, well, if he's the Messiah, I better, whoa, this is big. But they still didn't understand that the Messiah was God at that point. So here we have this, this woman and Jesus walking around the earth and he's telling her, here's how you worship. It's not about a mountain. It's not about a temple. You have to worship in spirit and in truth, which means you don't have to go to anywhere else. You can do it right where you are. Where you are. At home, at work, at play, I don't care where you are. You can do worship. But God also wants us to gather together. Because remember, back at the beginning, I read that quote that said that worship is community. It's important to be together. If we're not together, well, then we run into problems. Because a lone wolf gets isolated pretty fast. And you get lost. The report about the Christian religion from the Roman governor Pliny to the emperor Trajan about A.D. 113. This is an actual written document that exists out there. And it's a report on the Christian religion from this Roman governor. They were in the habit of meeting on a certain fixed day before it was light when they sang an anthem to Christ as God and bound themselves by a solemn oath not to commit any wicked deed but to abstain from all fraud, theft, and adultery, never to break their word or deny a trust when called upon to honor it, after which it was their custom to separate and then meet again to partake of food, but food of an ordinary and innocent kind. A Roman governor writing about what he saw of the Christian religion, the new Christian religion. And you know what? Sounds a lot like us, doesn't it? We get together, we commit, we have a covenant that says that we're going to live this way. And it was a lot of what you just finished reading there. And we get together to support each other. And we get together for meals. We have potlucks. It's very similar. Some things don't change. All the little things change. How we eat our meals together, what we talk about, where we are, those might change a little bit. But the, the idea of what worship is doesn't change. So if God could give us a definition of worship, what do you think it would be? 
Anybody got an idea what God's definition of worship would be? Praising him? Absolutely. Anything else? Thinking of other people. Molly's back. She's our spokesperson, I guess. You got to think. I want you to go home because next week I'm going to ask that question again. And I want better response. All right? What is God's idea of worship? He created us. He created us to be in worship with him and to worship him. What did he expect? That's next week. Finally, what is worship for us today? We have a Sunday service, which many call a worship service. Next week, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the stuff in that. All right? We have the freedom to worship God anywhere, anytime. We are not bound by rules and regulations that say, only here, only now. When Jesus died on that cross, and when he came back to life, and he ascended to heaven and left us the Holy Spirit, it was so that we would have an instant communication with God. We don't have to wait. We don't have to go anywhere. We don't have to have somebody else do it for us. We are in direct contact with God, in the presence of God at all times. Therefore, we should be worshiping at all times. Think about that. If you're going to be in the presence of God, you should be worshiping him. And that might be singing a song with him. That might be praying and talking to him. It might be just sitting there in the presence of God and feeling the incredible awesomeness of that. Whatever it is, we should be doing that all the time. Not just on Sunday mornings. Or at a prayer meeting. Or a Bible study. It's all the time, individually. I want to leave with this, this look at worship today with this final verse. You should memorize this one. All right? If you haven't already. Tw Romans 12, verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Remember back a couple of quotes? I said it was... Living the life pleasing to God. And here we're reading a verse that says, living a, a life, a living sacrifice. We don't have to kill anything. We give ourselves to God. Pleasing to God. And that's our spiritual act of worship. Next week we'll continue. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for this opportunity to be together. To look at what worship is. And Lord, just to get a start on it and to see that we need to think about exactly what is worship in your eyes and what is worship that we know and then to get them together. Father, I pray that you will help each one of us to realize the extent of your power and your presence and the fact that you created us. We would not be without you, Lord. And this world would not be. So thank you. And we want to give you the praise and the glory and the honor, Lord. As we bow our heads in front of you, we just pray, Father, that you will understand that it's because we, we glorify you and that we do really want to be pleasing to you. Lord, help us to know what is the right thing to say, the right thing to do, the right thing to think. Guide us in our thoughts, guide us in our actions, and just help us to know when you want us to walk and go for you. Be with each one of the ones that are here, Lord. Bless them this morning. And Father, for those that aren't here, we ask that this message will get to them and that they will understand the idea of worship. Thank you that you love us so much and that your first act was to create us. Lord, I just praise you for that. And your second great act was to bring Jesus down and to let him be the ultimate sacrifice so that we no longer had to worry, no longer had to wander in the wilderness, but we could be in your presence daily, hourly, minute by minute. Thank you, Lord, that you love us so much that you did that. 
Be with us now and guide us this week. Encourage us, uplift us, give us the strength, the, the boldness to walk a walk that is pleasing to you. In your son's precious name, amen. <laughs>